Hi, this is Steve Xiao from Digital Asset. In this video, we're going to dive right into demo. Think of me as a tour guide. Hi, this is Steve Xiao from Digital Asset. In this video, we're going to dive right into demo. Think of me as a tour guide. You're visiting an island that you've never been to before, and instead of showing you town to town to town, I'm going to put you on a chopper and we're going to fly around the island just to check out the key features. And once we have that mental map, we'll use that to dive into specific topics in future videos. If you're ready, buckle in. Let's start the tour with the front end. The front end is your choice. You may be building a mobile app, you may be building a web app or a native desktop app. The key here is to get your front end communicating with the back end that is managed by the demo framework. And the way we're going to do it is to have the front end talk to the JSON API exposed by the demo framework. There is more than one way to communicate with the data in the demo framework. But for the purposes and scope of this video, we'll focus on using the JSON API. The responsibility of the demo framework behind the scenes is to maintain a virtual shared ledger that your front end will eventually query against or create contracts out of. The beauty of demo is that you don't have to worry about consensus or wiring up proof of stake or anything like that or setting up hardware because all that can be taken care of for you because you can deploy your demo app on a distributed blockchain like Corda or VMware blockchain or Hyperledger Fabric, just to name a few. For the scope of this exercise, we're going to use something called Demo Hub, which is our cloud hosted platform. Or if you want to deploy it to a centralized database, you can easily deploy this to Postgres or Amazon QLDB. Now think about it. This really frees you up to work on your platform, your business logic, your user experience, and your architecture, because all that in the background is handled for you by the framework. Now, when was the last time we have to worry about how our database handle collisions or consistency or availability? We don't because it happens in the background. The code that you will write will reside in something called a .daml file. Now, a .daml file is then compiled into a .dar file or a .daml archive file. Now, the .dar shouldn't be confused with Dart files, which you find in, in frameworks like Flutter. Now, the .dar file is really what defines what we call a template in the framework. And a template is what the framework will use to create contracts or a list of commits of contracts. That is the part that is immutable. A way to think about templates and contracts in the framework is to think of the template like a cookie cutter. So when you use the cookie cutter, it produces a contract with some data in it. And this is a unit of data that cannot be modified. Now, suppose there is a reason to update information about this chain of data, we would have to use the template again to create a new contract based on the old one. Now, the latest one will be marked as active and any ones prior to that will be archived. Remember, in blockchain, we cannot mutate old data. Let's use a very simple example. Suppose we have a template, and the template captures information on the ownership of a car. We have the year of the car, and we have the information about the car and the odometer reading. The template itself will have no persistent information. It will be used to create a contract reflecting a particular owner that took the car and bought the car when it had 2,000 miles on the odometer. Now, this car is sold to a second owner, and the second owner at this time will accept the car, and by now, it has 5,000 on the odometer reading. Note that other information about the car cannot be mutated. It stays as a 2005 car. Now, when it's passed on to the next owner and so forth, the changes are reflected and a chain of these data is created. So there's a transaction of not just the owners, but information about the car that's meaningful. It is entirely possible and common for your demo project to have more than one template. For example, template A can create a contract 
and that contract produces and triggers the creation of another contract based off another template. Let's look at an example. Suppose you are selling your house and we are using template A to create a contract and the contract is really a listing stating the starting price of the house. Now we have a template B and a template B will produce another type of contract that's really the bid amounts that someone wants to put in. For example, the first person puts in $600,000 and that creates a contract of template B. Now a second person comes in and say, well, I want to pay $650,000. Now that's a new bid. We do not want to forget the old bid, so we create a new chain. And now there's a contract that says $650,000 is the latest, highest bid for the house. And a third person can come in and put in $750K. And now a new contract is created off template B to say that the latest amount, highest amount is $750,000. And perhaps at this point, the, the seller can decide that uh, it is sold. Let's take a closer look at a .demo file using a very simple example that you will come across in many of the other tutorials. Now, if the coding convention and syntax looks familiar, it is because this is based off a version of Haskell. You do not need to know Haskell or functional programming in order to write demo code. However, if you know Haskell or another functional programming language like Scala, it will definitely be useful. Let's take a look at the three core components of a demo file. There's always a data model. There's always permissions, which controls who can do what and see what data. And finally, there will always be your business logic. Let's dive deeper into a .demo file, and we'll start with the most important thing, commenting. In demo, you will comment a single line with two dashes, and if you need to comment out a block, you can use the curly braces like so. If we move down the line, we'll see the first keyword being used called module. Module is like a namespace, and it is used to create the abstract type, but we don't have to worry about that. Technically, there can be more than one module in a file, but for a demo project, keep it to one module in which everything is defined. It is really what's inside of this module that is meaningful. Next to the module, you see the word user. Now, this is the name of the module, and you set this value. It has to begin with an uppercase. Now, it doesn't have to be the name of the file itself, but I recommend that you keep it consistent because it's very common in demo development to import a module into another module. So this will help tremendously when you have a lot of modules that you're dealing with in your project. Right after user, you see the keyword where. Where defines your scope and your block. So it groups your logic together. Now comes the fun part, the template. The template keyword defines the behavior, the data model, and the rights and obligations. In other words, it's like the recipe for a contract. Remember that contracts are instances of a template. Template takes in an argument, which is the name of the template. In this case, it so happened to be the same name as the module, but it doesn't have to be. It must start with an uppercase. Now, this name is what the contracts that it produced will be a type of. For example, when we had a vehicle registration example, the template could be named vehicle registration. And whenever a contract is created out of that, that contract has a type and is a type of vehicle registration. And it's totally possible to have multiple templates inside of a module. For example, if I have a module called orders, it can have a template for drinks and it can have a template for appetizers. Next, we see the keyword with. With will start to define the required input arguments or parameters that the template needs in order to create a contract. In the vehicle registration example, we are going to need the name of the car, the year of the car, and the current odometer reading. Once the required information is provided, a contract can be created. Right underneath with, you will start to find the create arguments or parameters. 
Think of this as the section where you define the variables that are required to create a contract out of this particular template. The names of the variables must start with a lowercase. Now, this is a great moment to call out an interesting structure of demo code. Demo is what we call white space sensitive, just like Fortran or Python. Notice that there's no use of semicolons to end a line of code or the use of curly braces to block up a chunk of related code. That is because the language is going to look at the indentation or the white spaces to define meaningful blocks of code. Another requirement is that at minimal, there must be a input argument that has the party type. Let's take a closer look. This colon here means of type. So this line would read that username is of the type party. Note that this is using one colon, not two, as it would in pure Haskell. Following the colon is always a data type, and there are built-in types, including a tuple, which you can use to compose a mix of different data types. Moving down, we see a second use of the keyword where. The first time we saw it was at line four, when the module was defined and the entire scope of the module was created. This where defines a template body. So all of the arguments that were defined under with will be accessible inside of this scope. Underneath where is where you'll find one of the most important keywords, signatory. A signatory is a keyword that grants authorization roles to a defined party. Signatories must consent to the creation of a contract from a template. So you got to have at least one signatory. If you need to define more than one party, you can always use an array inside of the with block. Now, there are other party types as well, like observers and controller, which we'll go into later on. So the way you define who is the signatory for this particular template is to specify the, the argument name that was used above in the with block. In this case, we have the username, and it has to be a party type. So remember that there are two parts here. First, username has to be defined as a party. And then in line 12, it has to be made a signatory. We're going to skip the concepts of key and maintainer for a later video and go right into the controller. A controller is a party who can exercise an action on the contract. And these actions are called choices. Uh, another way to write this is to not start with a controller, but list the choices first. These are called flexible controllers. Right after the keyword controller is where you specify which party can be a controller. In this case, it is the username. Now this username, remember, it has to be defined inside of that with block in line eight. Now you will notice that in the example on the left, there is no keyword can after username. And that is because they're using the flexible controller style of specifying the choice. For learning purposes, I recommend starting with a alternate style where we start by specifying the controller and then the defined party and then the word can followed by the choices that that controller can do. So in this case, after we specify who is the controller, we will start to construct the choice. In this case, follow is the name of a choice. The name has to start with an uppercase. And this will be exercised or invoked by the controller, which can either be a signatory or an observer. Remember that the signatory is the person or the party that must authorize the creation of a contract out of a template. And the signatory can also exercise choices on a template in addition to the observer. So a simple example would be the selling of the home example that we used earlier on. So the, the seller of the house will be the signatory who authorizes the creation of a contract from a template that's basically a listing. And when the listing has gone on for a while, there may be a choice in that template that allows her to go, time is up, the bidding has finished, and she can exercise a choice 
on her template that closes out the bidding process. So she's both a signatory as well as a controller. A default behavior that you should be aware of is that every time a choice is exercised, it automatically archives that contract. Now, there may be instances where you need the contract to remain active. In that case, you want to use the keyword non-consuming to override that behavior. Ah, here we see the colon again. And remember, every time you see a colon, it's always followed by a type. So this line tells me that exercising this particular choice is going to return something, and that something is a contract, and that contract is built from the user template. Now, although it says contract ID, it doesn't just return the ID, it returns a newly created contract from that template. Here we see another use of the keyword with, and sure enough, we see uh, the next few lines defining the required input arguments or parameters. Now, the difference is that now we can supply arguments or variables into the choice as we're trying to exercise it, or we can get it from the variables that are within scope. For example, if there is a definition of the year of a car, 2005, then we can get it from within that scope instead of asking it to be supplied by whoever is exercising it. And finally, we have the do keyword. Now this starts the choice body, and this is where you start to code and define the actions that you have to take when a choice is exercised. That was a fun ride, wasn't it? In the next few episodes, we're gonna fire up Visual Studio and dive right in. I'm going to show you how to fire up what we call a sandbox so that you can get your demo app up and running locally on your laptop. See you next time.